All right. So today we have a we're in for a treat. We're going to talk talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the intersection of uh, cybersecurity and generative AI with John Zhang. He is the co-founder, CTO, and VP of engineering at Nexus Flow AI. And uh, according to their website, here's the here's their tagline: generative AI for cybersecurity, total ownership total empowerment. So with that, welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast, John. Yeah, very nice meeting you here, Ben. You know, like uh, really uh, feel really like excited to be here discussing with you on like, you know, general AI solutions, the cybersecurity in general. Uh, you know, that's a that's a very exciting area like, uh, you know, this year and upcoming year. So super happy to discuss on that. All right. So we'll, uh, listeners will jump into cybersecurity shortly, but uh, before we do that, I do want to cover this very interesting announcement from uh, Nexus Flow regarding Nexus Raven, which mm -hmm. is uh, their kind of foundation model and uh, that uh, is now on a second version. So, yeah, uh, yeah. John, um, first off, what exactly is Nexus Raven? Yeah. So basically, in one sentence, Nexus Raven is an open source model that can empower like the generative AI copilots and agents to use a vast pool of tools uh, to help them accomplish a lot of tasks. Uh, and I think like it probably worth like a uh, one minute mentioning like you know this like copilot and 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 this tool use concept uh, because I, I think like problem like earlier this year and little bit last year, like, you know, Microsoft comes up with this, like, you know, Copilot's concept on their softwares. Uh, and we suddenly see like, you know, um, you know, the industry uh, booming, like for a lot of like the uh, Copilot's and agents concept, right? And for some of like the creative, like the style agents or Copilot's where you like, like I generate a PowerPoint or generate a poll, right? So those things you can uh, purely rely on these large language models to generate text. Right. Uh, but, you know, for a lot of like the scenarios, especially when you're focusing on serious workflows, uh, you, you, you typically like want more like a reliable outcomes uh, and you want to expand the capability of these models uh, by interfacing in uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, external tools while enabling the users to be able to interact with these things to accomplish workflows using just natural language instructions. Right, so uh, that's the concept of where it comes, uh, and you know, like uh, uh, the con you know, like also the context of why like these tool use stuff is so important um, uh, to have, like to build a successful copilot and 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 agency in a lot of the cases, right? Um, and I, I think like uh, to implement such like a capability to use tools, uh, you know, like a, a function calling capability is just a way to um, you know implement such capabilities, right? Uh, so uh, you can, you know, I, I'll probably share like uh, my uh, share my screen on these slides for one, one minute. Uh, and okay, uh, listeners, uh, uh, you may want to uh, check out the YouTube video for this portion of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. So you can see my screen, right? So yeah. fundamentally, like really, the, the specific function quality, uh, function calling capability is that hey, you have an agent, you have a, a copilot, uh, and it can see like, you know, software documents or you know, the tool documents or descriptions of what it can accomplish, even though it's not seen during the training of these models or these copilots, right? Uh, and then, you know, the users gives, you know, query instruction uh, and this model by looking at these documents, it can help the users to accomplish a task, right? Like uh, specifically by generating some of the code, calling the functions, the APIs, right? Which implements the functionality of these software tools, right? So this is the, uh, concept of like function calling, which implements like tool usage. So uh, John, uh, for for listeners who uh, may be familiar with uh, the term retrieval augmented generation. So mm -hmm. how does this relate to that? Yeah. So I think like, uh, you know, um, I would say in some sense, uh, this function calling capability could be a partially overlapping and sometimes like the super side of this like a uh, uh, right concept. Right, like think of like a rag as an external tool as well, right? Like if you think about like a vector database, right? Or, you know, use the conventional like a retrieval tools, like, you know, Elasticsearch about like on, on documents and stuff like that. Uh, so those things can always be a tool to accomplish what you want to accomplish, right? Because like, you know, for rag, like if you build like a document question answering stuff, it's pretty much like, you know, triggering external like vector database or those 
uh, conventional search tools to pull all the information for the model to synthesize, right? So that that's why I'm saying like, hey, um, you know, the, the, the this this concept of tool use uh, and function calling can be a super side of the rec, uh, but you know, not 100% overlapping because people have like maybe different implementations and formulations of this stuff. So, so Nexus Raven itself um, uh, in this architecture is the LLM, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. and and so what uh, what exactly is Nexus Raven? So is it pre-trained from scratch, or did you take an open source model and fine tune it? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so basically, like uh, uh, I I think like you can think of like Nexus Raven. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Uh, you know, like uh, you, you can think Nexus Raven as a orchestrator for this entire workflow, right? Like you have uh, uh, you know a lot of tools lining up there. Right and defined by those API functions, uh, and the other side, the user wants to give you a natural language in, uh, instruction. This Raven model is powering the copilot to say, I, I take in this like uh, queries, I can generate the code to orchestrate these these tools to accomplish my task. Right, and regarding like how this model is generated, so basically we build on top of the Llama two model, uh, specific Llama two like a thirteen B model, uh, because you know we are a big embracer of like you know open model concepts. Uh, and basically, like we do, um, you know, targeted instruction tuning uh, for uh, for the uh, for the Nexus Rhythm model, uh, enhancing the uh, data volume and data quality uh, towards making it super powerful for doing these function calling tasks for tool use. And, and so the 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 list of tools and APIs that Nexus Raven. Uh, supports is that uh, you 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 guys explicitly document and reveal that oh so interesting this is a very good concept because like uh, um you know for this river model we emphasize a lot about the generalizability of tool use uh you can think of like uh, um uh you know one type of the function calling models are previously existing in open source is that Hey, I, I I tune this model on like you know three or four or some number of like uh, fixed tools, uh, and all the user can do is that um, you know I can use this model to orchestrate these a few like predefined tools by the producer of this model, right? But I think the mission of Nexus Riven is broader, uh, it's more ambitious, uh, it's more like uh, a, a a open source alternative, you know, in comparison to like uh, OpenAI's function calling API. Meaning like this is enabling the developers, enabling the people who want to build on top, right? Uh, and the generalization here, what I mean is that like this river model can deal with the tools that is not seen before uh, during the training. And the way that people can give information about like the new tools that they want to use is by providing the, let's say the API function signatures. Because programmers, they all know like, you know, sure. uh, the signature of the functions, right? Like argument function name, right? Uh, and also, like you know, uh, we can provide a little bit doc doc string to the functions or you know, to the tools. Like for example, hey, if I want to talk about, let's say, um, you know, cybersecurity side is a virus total, right? Like uh, I'll I'll describe like this tool as, hey, it's a it's an information source that can help you scan like you know the artifacts, tell you like if there's any vulnerabilities or something like that, right? Uh, and 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 you know, in this way, like the developers can uh, provide these like uh, descriptions. Of the tools, in some sense, to the Riven model on the fly, right? Like meaning, like you know, optionally, Riven can be further tuned to enhance certain things. But if you want to use it for out of box for a new tool, you just provide, um, you know, the 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 uh, doc string, the function signatures you are happy with, and then you know, boom, it starts. You can give a query, and then you start to operate for you. So, so uh, if. You know, referring to the word copilot, right? So I, mm -hmm. I was one of the first users of GitHub Copilot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think of in that context, the word copilot means like an assistant. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so something that helps you, makes you more productive. Mm -hmm. So is that what you mean here, or is is it a much more uh, powerful concept in the sense that copilot in this sense means it's actually helping you build an application? Oh, that's a good question. No, no, no. I, I think like the concept is very similar to what you are describing. Like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Nexus Riven is a model. It helps developers to build or power developers like copilots uh, yeah. to use tools. 
right? And and you know, like uh, exactly like this copilot, uh, is concept is oriented to help people, um, you know, in an interactive way, right? And and you know, taking your natural language instructions help you accomplish certain tasks interactively, right? The the agent concept in the community is uh, slightly more uh, ambitious. Uh, you know, it's more like, you know, I give you one single thing and you accomplish like a lot, long sequence of tasks for me as well. You know, both the copilot concept and the agent concept have their like uh, suited areas. Uh, and, you know, we see a lot of like great things coming out this year. Pre pretty sure like, you know, more things will come out next year as well. <laughs> so, so next is Raven. So how do you, so in this, in this uh, domain, John, so how do you know that uh, you built something that's better than, uh, Mm -hmm. Let's say GitHub Copilot, if that's who you're comparing oh. to. So, what are yeah. some of the benchmarks that people use in this area? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, maybe let me first clarify one thing. Uh, yeah. So, basically, like you know, this uh, specific like Nexus Ribbon is not exactly in comparison to uh, you know like a yeah. GitHub Copilot, right? right. If you get, because like you know, it's a uh, it's more of like GitHub Copilot is more freeform code generation, yeah. uh, helping you code and stuff. This is more of like turning users' intentions into like orchestration of the APIs and tools, right? But I think you have a good point. Uh, so anytime you develop something, you know, I'm a true believer of like looking at the metrics like uh, quantitatively, uh, for sure, like you also need to look at the user feedback, but you know, like I think a benchmark is very uh, important in this scenario. Uh, and when we released this model, we uh, released it uh, with a human curated benchmarks measuring different models uh, on how good they are in terms of the function calling capabilities. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to give like, you know, probably two minute story about why we spent the time to come up with this benchmark. Uh, it's a very interesting story. You know, like when we, when we, um, you know, when we first started like uh, 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 this, like a Riven, Riven or Riven V2 efforts, you know, the background is that, hey, you know, at that time point, like OpenAI's function calling API is already starting taking off. A lot of developers are using them to build their like Copilot agents or some of the applications. Uh, but, you know, there's always a lot of reasons, like a lot of people want to find a alternative open source version to power their copilots and applications. Uh, but unfortunately, at that time, even though there are some initial trials, um, they still, you know, if you talk to the developers, they still don't have like a option, open source option that they feel, um, you know, it, it works well in my real world scenarios, robustly enough uh, in the world, right? Uh, and that's the motivation of why we started these efforts. You know, it's also very significant, like, you know, signals from the cybersecurity uh, for, for this type of stuff. Um, uh, and then we, we started to think about making these efforts to, to create this model and power the open source community. Uh, and the first thing you will see, like, you know, we'll, we'll measure like the open models, like on, on, on how good they are already on these type of stuff. Uh, but, you know, like we started like from pulling out some of the existing nearby benchmarks uh, but one of the things that we, we we noticed is that like a, a lot of like the benchmarks, um, you know, they mix the function calling capability measurements with the conversational capabilities. It's very hard to fully decouple those and get a very reliable uh, estimation, right? And you know, like still like our still our hope is like, hey, we'll take those like data set because you know we are in this area. We know these data sets help help us uh, move forward a lot to push the boundary already. Uh, so we, we we think about like, hey we take these data sets we are trying to programmatically turn them and isolate things to measure the uh, uh, you know like the, the the function calling capability in isolation right uh, but still like because it's a programmatic approach um, that's the first factor the second factor is like the original data set a lot of those uh, benchmark data set that are partially curated by the large language models itself uh, and there are a lot of like you know um, hidden like issues uh, that doesn't 100% reflect the reality, how people will judge like uh, the quality of those things. So then, you know, the only option left for us is that, hey, you know, we put together like a few engineering folks within our team. We're pulling a few like, you know, engineers from the community as well. So we work together. We take in some of like the real world software tools. Like some of them are cybersecurity oriented, like Virus Total, like uh, NVD search for vulnerabilities. Uh, and you know, some of those is like, uh, uh, you know, more general purpose tools like, uh, um, you know, uh, like Google Place APIs, some of the climate query APIs, uh, some, some type of things like that. And then we let the people read the documents uh, and, you know, like generate a description of the tools and the functions. Uh, and we let them like curate like queries uh, and code pairs 
about like what they want to accomplish, right? Uh, and then you know that's the that's the whole story of like how our benchmark comes out. Uh, and you know like we spend a lot of time to uh, meticulously like check the uh, validness of these examples um, on its executability on the uh, alignment of the query intention and the exact code. Uh, so basically, you know, like we put in a lot of efforts to make to ensure like this benchmark could first ensure it's measuring function quality capability in isolation. And second, like we put in a lot of efforts to make sure like it gets as close as possible as a proxy to what real life developers will be facing at. So uh, let's say I invite you to give a keynote at a conference. Mm -hmm. And I give you three slides to hammer home this notion of a uh, co-pilot for function calling. Mm -hmm. um, and in those three slides, uh, you'll give me three examples mm -hmm. of things that people may use it for or things that people have actually used Nexus Raven for. So what mm -hmm. are the three most interesting and illustrative examples that you can uh, think of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like, uh, uh, you know, there are two ways to think about this, you know, like we will see like which way you, 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 would, you would prefer it. So one way is like, you know, um, there, there are different type of ways of using function, fu function calling, or, you know, there's also like, you know, different applications uh, that is powered by function calling. Uh, you know, if it's about like, you know, um, you know, different ways uh, to use like function calling, uh, you know, I, I'll probably like show you this example uh, on the slides. C can I share? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can see it here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you think about like the um, the ways of you use like for example Nexus Raven for function calling, you know in the, in the real world you, you typically see like three type of cases developers typically face, right? Uh, and, and one type of thing is the most straightforward thing, like is a, is a what we call like single function calling. Right? Uh, and if you think about it, it's like I ask, hey, do I need a jacket now in New York, right? Naturally, the tool you call is like you want to get a temperature in New York. Right, uh, and you just trigger it, within that query. You only trigger one function, one API, one tool, and you accomplish what you want. Get the information you want to answer that. Right, um, and the second concept is well, this like a parallel function calling. Right, uh, and uh, think about this example. Um, this is a little bit restricted, but you can think of it that way. So I want to know, hey, what is the temperature in New York, Chicago, and Paris? How they compare to each other? Right. And then what you would do is like you would call like three function, like three times, like, you know, get temperature for New York, for Chicago, for Paris, and then you compare it. Right. Uh, and this is like, you know, uh, this is a concept of like you, you call like the same tool for multiple times uh, or you. Call and like and to, to clarify, John, this function get temperature mm -hmm. is uh, an external API. Yeah. Yeah. You can think of like external API for a tool. Right. Um, but, but the developer, what the developer writes is literally this function call. Oh, no, no, no. So natural basically, language. It, it's natural uh, so, language, so what, right? Yeah. So what the developer will provide is like, you know, a, a definition of this, like a get fu temperature function, right? Like a, yeah. just a signature, right? And then describe, hey, this is for getting you a, like weather or getting you a temperature uh, if you trigger it. Right? Oh, I see. And then, then, uh, then now you can start asking natural language questions. Exactly. Exactly. I see. Exactly. I see. Exactly. Yeah, and this is a concept of parallel functions, right? Um, you know, either it's like one one tool you call it multiple times without dependency, or it's multiple tools that you call it in parallel without dependency to gather different informations, right? Uh, and and the third part is like you know what we hear the most from like uh, uh, developers actually uh, is about what we call like nested or composite like function callings, right? So you, you naturally have a lot of tools that you need to like couple a few functions to accomplish your goals, right? For example, like, you know, I, I want to say, hey, do I need to wear a jacket outside of the hotel I live in, right? So naturally what you need to do is like, hey, you need to at least get a hotel name. And then you use the hotel name to know where is your location. And then you need to use the location to get a temperature, right? Uh, and why we call this like a nice composite function is because you see um, these functions are connected, right? Like the output of certain functions is input of other functions. Right, they have different type of connections or in like uh, uh, dependencies, uh, and that that is also a very like important case we see a lot from our uh, you know developer friends request. So you can see like these are the three type of like a uh, function calling like a uh, uh, use cases in the in a more conceptual way, right? Uh, so this uh, 
John, this Nexus Raven sh ship with uh, kind of a baseline number of function calls it already knows. So I know that you can give it hints by giving it uh, kind mm -hmm. of descriptors of a function, but out of the box, does Nexus Raven have uh, some baseline capabilities? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me clarify this. Uh, so basically what I'm saying like, hey, uh, it can uh, use the unseen tools. It means like uh, when you build on top of Raven, you still need to like, you know, provide these definitions of the tools, right? Mm -hmm. even, uh, even though like these tools definitions is not seen during the training of that. Uh, and, and, you know, like basically you provide these things and then you can, you can start to query it. Uh, and in our benchmark, when we report the quality, when we release this model, we actually only report on the uh, softwares and tools that is not seen during the training. So basically you can imagine like, uh, um, you know, we on purpose ensure like uh, these, uh, this model is trained on the data, like, like those data have never include anything related to the few tools that we, uh, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, like curated in the benchmark, right? So that it can ensure like you measure the uh, capability on those unseen tools. So let's say I have, uh, I'm I'm a Python or Java, JavaScript developer, mm -hmm. and I hear about an interesting new library. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tell Nexus Raven, here's the documentation for the library. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? Yeah. That's enough. You you sometimes you know, like if the document is too large, you yeah. probably want to summarize a little bit. Otherwise, yeah. the context lines cannot feed in. But then but uh, from from, from there on, Nexus mm -hmm. Raven can help me. Yeah, exactly. You provide those information into the prompts, and you attach the user queries, and it will help you figure out what code to call. But then, uh, I guess my question is, Nexus Raven because it was instructed and tuned must know a lot of the most popular libraries already, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So basically, like, uh, you know, like, uh, um, the way we cured this data, like, we we didn't intentionally, you know, like, uh, sort out like, you know, what library we use. Uh, basically, what we use is like, you know, uh, we uh, pull out some of the public commercially usable code corpus. Uh, like, you, like, uh, folks in the LM community knows uh, uh, knows about this, like, uh, this I called the the stack. The stack, which is a very large like code repository open for like you know commercial use, research use, right? Uh, and then we just uh, we have a, like a programmatic programmatic like curation a data curation pipeline. We just blindly run that on all the like available code uh, from the stack and extract the data. Uh, we don't have like any uh, intentional like monitoring like of uh, which uh, you know which tools like uh, exactly we uh, you know we included there. Uh, and mostly, I think like uh, the you know, um, qualitative speaking, like the examples that we have seen from the data we curated, most of them are something like, uh, uh, is like user-defined functions uh, in that rep repository uh, and the use cases that they call those functions. That's how we mine those stuff. It's not like, uh, the majority of the things is not like any like very widely public available like repositories. So Nexus Raven itself mm -hmm. is 100% open source? Yeah, so basically, like, you know, we are bounded by the Llama license, right? right? Like, uh, uh, you know, we are a true believer of, like, open source model. That's how you, like, make this entire community move faster. You know, like, commercialize, like, is, is very helpful. Uh, and uh, if you check out our license of uh, Nexus Riven V2, uh, you'll see, like, uh, we just, you know, <laughs> just routinely duplicate, like, a Llama 2, like, uh, uh, license uh, with, like, the necessary, like, legal modifications, changing the you know, like the company entity names and your names of the models and stuff. Uh, basically, like you know, uh, whatever you 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 want to do with like Llama base Llama two base model, you can use it with like the uh, next Riven V two model there as well. Um, so, and... have you heard from uh, users outside of uh, the company? So, mm -hmm. and uh, if you have, so what's the most interesting uh, use case that you've heard of? Oh, you mean like using the function calling, right? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think there are, um, you know, I you know I, I, we have been like talking to customer like a, uh, like you know very large volume after the release. Yeah. There's a lot of like you know the the potential customers like uh, uh, reach out after seeing this release through different channels, uh, and I think like you know um, I think I think like uh, um, one category is like a lot of like you know the software uh, vendors builders they want to start to have these capabilities right like you know uh, you have like an assistant or in like a navigator 
uh, to help like uh, their users to use their software, right? Like uh, you mean uh, you mean uh, inside an enterprise, they have a lot of developers and they want a tool like this. Um, I think oh, that's actually another case, right? Like uh, uh, maybe let me uh, wrap up like the first case. The so first case you can imagine, like for example, um, you know, I, I will say example, not exactly the company name, right? <laughs> but for yeah. example, think about like you know, uh, Salesforce maybe like uh, uh, you know, or some alternative to Salesforce. They want to say hey. Uh, you know, we we want to give a navigator or a system of our software because, like, after years, it oh, can so many different things. For uh, for for, uh, for people who who are using Salesforce. Yeah, yeah. For example, like that's one type of the so cases. It's like uh, it's like uh, improving their documentation in some ways, or you know, like uh, helping some new users. Yeah. To jumpstart much quicker on their software, yeah, exactly. help some of the experienced ones. That is. Uh, uh, you know, expanding their like knowledge about how to use these software for advances. So, so you can imagine anyone with uh, who wants to attract developers who will want this, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. Where you are building developer platforms, you are building software platform, developer can help on, right? So that's a uh, that's one category. The second category is really like, hey, a lot of the workflows inside enterprise. You know, like they have a lot of tools like on the table. Uh, you know, like they. You know, some of like the the type of workflows that the professionals working on that is have a very high like uh, uh, renewal rates. Meaning, somebody leave you, you get some somebody pipe, pipe in. It takes time to to ramp them up to use all of these stuff, right? And then they they are thinking about hey, they want to have like you know consolidation tool, uh, and and make the process easier, easier to learn, uh, easier to use, uh, much more efficiency, higher throughput, processing these stuff. Uh, reduce the requirement on, on human being or save human being uh, more times to work on the most challenging parts and save save their time on some of the parts that you can partially automate or you know interactively automate right so that's a uh, um, you know that's probably like the two uh, major cases we have been hearing about uh, but you know we have a lot of like different and, uh, and uh, in, well. yeah. in in the second case with the enterprise it also helps with you know if someone leaves the organization, you know, uh, you might still be able to maintain and move forward with that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Really good point because, like, you know, um, you know, for example, in cybersecurity, like, you have someone like having a routinely maintained stuff, and then he left. Um, you know, uh, you know, the hope of these co-pilots and agents, like, starting from being able to, you know, helping people, they record how people, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, interact with these things. In the longer run, like, maybe uh, there, there could we could leverage like the collective behaviors. Uh, and how how make these things like uh, you know uh, being more automated like newcomers they can like look at these stuff and and then they learn those stuff or you know they can be offloaded because like the <laughs> copilot already like knows how to deal with it. So what's the what's the next step for Nexus Raven? You're you're now in V two. So are you yeah, just yeah. the idea is to keep releasing new versions of the regular cadence or or are you mm -hmm. going to wait until Llama? Three comes out, and then you come out with another version. Yeah, it's it's, it's a good thing. Uh, I think our internal development never stop, never waiting for anything. Like you know, there are a lot of things to do. But I have to say, like, because uh, like you know, after release, like developers give us a lot of feedbacks uh, and and requests. So we we put those things in uh, as well, right? Like because uh, some of those developers represent like what they need, like in the enterprise, uh, and. Uh, you know the second part is like we are we are continuously monitoring like the the uh, latest like base uh, open models that we can build on top, right? Uh, and uh, uh, you know we are definitely very looking forward to Llama three, right? Like you know uh, and and you know, like uh, uh, you know there there I I I I could imagine there will be a lot of like you know improvement from Llama three hopefully, uh, so uh, that is one type of things that we are doing. Uh, and what, what about uh, what about the uh... So you guys do instruction tuning. So you gather the you a corpus of data. Yeah, yeah. Are you continually improving that data set? Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Because like you know, like uh, for those things, a lot of the input from the developers, uh, from our potential customers, uh, and uh, we internally also develop you know like discover things that we need to improve, uh, and basically think about like this, uh, this like uh, um continuation of development, a big portion of it is on the data development or in like the data curation tool, tool development for us, right? Uh, because like, you know, the base model, they will continually to evolve. Uh, and, you know, we are embracer of like, you know, open source models uh, and we build on top, right? Uh, and, and we return these like efforts back to the open source community as well. Uh, so you can see like, uh, 
um, you know, yeah, a lot of the efforts is on like uh, um, data curation, data curation pipeline, uh, uh, and incorporating feedbacks. Uh, and another part is like, you know, um, you know, taking like a new advanced open models uh, and build on top to see like whether we can push boundary for them. All right, so let's spend the, the last few minutes just talking about generative AI and cybersecurity. So I guess yeah. maybe you can stop sharing. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. At, at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm actually quite happy that you folks are focused on cybersecurity because it's such an important area. <laughs> and also uh, it's a great area for a startup because they have well-defined budgets. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so wh why of all the different domains? So you got to focus on finance or, or healthcare. Why cybersecurity? Yeah. So there are multiple reasons. Um, you know, um, when we started this company, you know, or, you know, even before that, when we're brainstorming about things, so it's very important for us to think about like, what is our initial focus to vertical, right? Uh, and ideally this vertical is something that you can catch the first wave uh, that you run ahead of the curve. Uh, and also there's a big market in this vertical. Like, as you said, like there's a well-defined budget, people are willing to spend here. Uh, there's a big, like, you know, dollar numbers like in the in the market estimations right you know we examine multiple like uh, uh you know verticals along along the line of like whether they are fulfilling these like two uh two like concepts we have in mind right uh so at the time we started this company you can see like for example like uh, uh, the the marketing copilots or in like the, the sales copilots uh or in like the legal copilots like uh you know like is already started to be booming, right? Like, you know, uh, a lot of the company uh, jumping in, right? Like including larger ones, smaller ones, new ones, like ones that has been in you know, like growth stage as well, right? So it's very crowded stuff, uh, very crossed like, you know, a uh, playground already. But at that time point, you know, we found something that, hey, you know, um, cybersecurity vertical, like, uh, of course, every, you know, we all know like it's a good like budget like uh, area uh, and you know, like uh, there's a great need for those things and it naturally, you know, you fight with like attackers, like it continuously evolves. You need new things to 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 get get in like new blood to let things flow, right? Uh, so uh, that's that's a, a very good like observation there. Uh, and also, we found like the, you know, like the uh, cybersecurity community. They have been working in like you know the precision AI for a while, uh, and you know like that's mostly about like hey, I'll detect the different things, uh, uh, you know, like using classification. You know, they're they're. Their workflow could be very complicated and very sophisticated, very powerful, uh, but that's mostly on the uh, conventional like machine learning side of things. And when this like general the AI thing comes out, uh, we see a lot of like uh, you know um, desires uh, or in like excitement in this in this community as well. So that's a great like meet point, right? Like uh, uh, the people in this community, this vertical is super excited. They know exactly why they need those stuff, right? Like uh, because they have a software offering, they have service offering, they have operation stuff in cybersecurity, right? Uh, and uh, you know, they have a good budget, right? Uh, and you know, like, uh, uh, you know, they just started on the generative AI side. Uh, they need like, you know, um, some of the smaller companies to work together uh, to provide solutions or, or, or in like, you know, uh, work together to to uh, provide like certain stuff to to help them jumpstart, right? So uh, that's, the, that's the reason, you know, why we, uh, you know, select this vertical as our choice. And actually, every year I make a point of trying to go to the uh, Expo Hall of RSA Conference in San Francisco. Yeah. It is massive. There are so many companies. Many of them claim to do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's very confusing for the user as to <laughs> what's the real solution and what's not. So yeah. uh, what's your target persona at this yeah. point? Yeah. So who's your target user and, and what what's the target what are the target use cases for those users? Yeah, yeah. So let let, let me like uh, uh, give an answer to, to this one by one. So if you think about like uh, uh, the type of like, uh, be, because we are a 2B business, right? Like we, we sell to like uh, in like a business, right? So, um, and we are specifically focused on enterprise. Right. We're specifically fo focused on enterprise. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we serve uh, the personas inside the enterprise. Right. Uh, typically, like uh, we uh, engage with the cybersecurity analysts, the cybersecurity operation, and some of the cybersecurity engineering teams. Uh, so basically, you can imagine like the the uh, you know the, the professionals on those teams are our natural like uh, you know. So like, they use they use tools like Splunk. 
Mm -hmm. or some other some other tool like that where they try to wade through lots of log files and things yeah. like that right yeah so for example like if you think about like the cybersecurity operation side of things like you know uh people like you know they they play with splunk right uh you know they they use certain like sore tools right like uh, uh you know splunk is cm side of things yeah. uh so people like uh uh, um, you know, the, the cybersecurity operation team, like the analysts there, they, they continuously operating these softwares to, to work in their workflow. Uh, some of like these teams have uh, some engineering um, arms there, right? They, they try to like, you know, integrate things and, and provide like certain toolings for their internal like, analysts as but well. They, uh, generally, the profilers, there's lots of data. You need some way to make these people more efficient so they can wade through the most serious incidents, right? Yeah, exactly. Like uh, we want to empower them to be able to use the tools they have on hand more efficiently, save them time to focus on more, more you know, like more interesting, more challenging stuff. And, and as the number of tools grow, then mm -hmm. you need a tool like uh, what you folks are offer offering. So you don't need to learn the details of uh, the ins the ins and outs of every tool, right? Yeah, yeah. So basically, at least it can make the learning curve like a much smoother, a uh, much much flatter. And so, so there's obviously the uh, the the one direction, which is using AI and ML to help uh, cybersecurity. But there's also cybersecurity can also help ML and yeah. AI, right? Because cybersecurity yeah, yeah. has a long tradition in penetration testing mm -hmm. and, and uh, hacking. And mm -hmm. so, a lot of these AI models have are about to be more widely used, but maybe they haven't been as put to the test as some of the you know web applications that are exactly. uh, that have now at least uh, a suite of tools that they can test against, right? Yeah, yeah. So exactly, I, I think like you know, um, you know, really like these two concepts is like you know AI for security, and also like security for AI, right? Uh, you know, and and a lot of times you know like. Uh, from our view, these things sometimes they they interleave with each other, right? But of course, like you have the applications, like you know, hey, I want to do like you know software vulnerability testing using like you know, hey, uh, you know, like uh, uh you know, uh, generative AI. That's one aspect. Also, like I have cases like you know, hey, uh, you know, uh, I want to say uh, I test like you know how safe or how like you know suitable uh my my LM is is working for my scenarios without like speaking something that like is ridiculous, right? Uh, the, there exists like a, a disjoint uh, use cases or in like these disjoint like uh, scenarios, but also if you see like uh, um, there's also the intersections of these two things, uh, and also like a lot of cases when we talk to customer, you just, you get this sense as well. For example, like you know one of the reasons that you do copilots with tool is because you want to reduce hallucination, make sure you don't speak something randomly that could trigger troubles, right? Uh, and uh, so so uh, how do you how do how does this function calling aspect Reduce an hallucination because uh, rag, rag, rag. One can say that maybe because you're hitting a well-defined data source, mm -hmm. the chances are you might get a relevant answer. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's very similar concept. It's because you provide this model with the tool definitions and set of tools to let let the model select from. Right, is making sure like you know they can give you more reliable things instead of like coming up uh, you know more hallucinating like a. Uh, results in a text form, right? So so I get that you you have tools that can help cybersecurity teams, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I imagine your tools can be also used by attackers, right? So if attackers <laughs> can become, become more productive if they use your function calling tools, maybe you're like the next generation Metasploit, right? So. <laughs> yeah, this is a very interesting point. And I think like, you know, that's the reason why I'm saying like sometimes there's a little bit overlap there between AI for security and security for AI. Um, so for example, like, you know, regarding like function calling models, if you talk about security of like function calling models, you know, you want to make sure it does not do something bad to you, right? And if you're doing something like mutate your software system status, you don't want it to do some disaster there, right? So how you can like, you know, uh, make sure like you, you got real these stuff, like either by, uh, you know, getting some like, uh, you know, rule-based stuff, or, you know, you use like RHF or some of like, you know, the human, you know, uh, preference feedback incorporation mechanism to incorporate those stuff. 
uh, you know, you you know, like the, these are very important topics for like uh, the safety of these tools. And actually, like for uh, for Nexus, like you know, uh, flow, uh, you know, we put in also efforts to to, to think along these lines. Uh, and you know, uh, so you what know, the, what are some of the specific strategies to mm -hmm. do you use? Do you use like red teaming, mm -hmm. uh, reinforcement learning? Uh, oh. mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Prompt so I think like yeah. So so yeah. what what specific tests did you did you undertake to make sure that you're before you release this model mm -hmm. uh it, you have some safe guards in in place. Oh, so basically you know, like we have a, a spectrum of things. Uh you know like some of the things are, are discovered after we release the model. Uh and you know like that's helping us grow as well as a, as a new company, right? Like we learn a lot from this release. So what we found is very interesting. So basically, you know, um, a lot of the current like opinions is like, hey, you use like another large language model to uh, get real input or get real output of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, your major model, right? We do find this very helpful, right? This is a very very useful tool, and and of course, like you know, we will adopt it as well, right? But importantly, we found like a lot of cases from our observation. Is, is, is not really enough. And sometimes you feel like, you know, uh, that methodology alone will trigger some of the um, engineering workload explosion in some sense, if you like make everything like rule-based. Um, and sometimes in like, uh, you know, the, 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 the gating models will have like things slip through. So basically like we, uh, you know, we, we have some discoveries, you know, like uh, also in collaboration with, uh, with like, you know, university and other places like, you know, like using some of like, you know, the, um, depending on the cases, using some of like the DPO uh, or, you know, RHF style or RL, AIF style mm -hmm. stuff um, is helping like uh, uh, patching a lot of the issues uh, the conventional guard real uh, stuff have there. Uh, and, you know, like, uh, you know, in, in, in Nexus, in Nexus flow, like uh, we do have customers, you know, talk with us on this type of things. And we, you know, we're super happy to provide them these, these toolings, like uh, in addition to these models on these topics. So is Nexus, Raven, and generally your tools, they are, are basically strong in any programming language or are they stronger in certain programming languages? Mm, yeah, so I think like the Nexus, Raven, uh, as our like, uh, you know, one of the initial trials to give back to the open source community, uh, we focus the tuning of this model mostly on Python functions, on Python language. Uh, and indeed, like uh, this very interesting. I've released like a lot of uh, like a uh, developer to come say, hey, I want this like a uh, uh, programming language. I want that programming language. Uh, and you know, we do have a few developers like trying out this model. Uh, you know, for a lot of the language that in conceptual like is it's about like these. Uh, That's same not, type well, of Python. Python is not enough for cybersecurity, though, right? Exactly, exactly. So, so basically, you know, we have a we have like a, you know other type of like a, a languages. That can uh you know be accommodated in Riven to some extent, but also we learned from this release and you know like we are going to incorporate more language that is needed there as well. Like for example, you know, like as you said, like hey, people play with with Sim like they play with Splunk, right? <laughs> like they have their SPL stuff as well. So a lot lot of things happening there. One hundred percent agree with you on that. So so uh, Jen, one of the things that worries me about uh, Python in general mm -hmm. is the supply chain. Right, so <laughs> every time you pip install a library, it is installing so many other libraries that you don't know what's going on, right? So yeah, yeah. So is this something that you folks will tackle at some point? The the whole, you know, if if I'm gonna use a function, maybe you guys can tell me, hey, uh, you might be you might want to be careful. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because I think you know, that's naturally tied to this like vertical, right? Like because cybersecurity folks like they care about like security a lot, right? And and for example, you see like, you know, the dependent bot on, on GitHub, like that that's automatically telling you, hey, there's a certain potential risk you should be careful about. Uh, and I think like to leverage these models well, there needs a lot of utilities around that to help the customer easily and, and you know, more efficiently develop things on top of that, right? Uh, and I think like, you know, your idea is, is, is very, very great. Like, you know, like how we can like, uh, you know, like let people like all, automatically ingest like you know the 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 tools, their descriptions, like their definitions, and automatically determine like, hey, there's a certain risk associated with some of the things. You need to be careful about that. And then maybe I can generally report for you to say, hey, you install all these stuff. I want to use this stuff. Here's the potential risk. You need to be careful, and you can delete something you don't want, right? 
So one of the things uh, I alluded to in cybersecurity, these analysts work with uh, massive data sets. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, not that you are, because you're, what you're doing is generating function calls, mm -hmm. but you want to have a tool that uh, is both fast, dependable, and stable, right? Mm -hmm. So, and uh, I imagine besides besides the uh, back end, you know, investing in uh, in scalability, latency, and stability, uh, you also need to invest a lot in UX, right? Because basically, uh, uh, in, you know, in cybersecurity, the, the better the UX, the more productive the analyst, right? Exactly, exactly. So basically, you know, this this like a, a concept of UI UX. I also want to touch on it, right? So uh, I, I think like you know, for the large language models, they're not perfect, right? And very important aspect is like how you design like the user interaction flow for it, right? Like sometimes you make mistakes, how you can keep the user engaged, right? How you can de de design a mechanism that only offload the things that the large model is most capable with on top of that and use other methodology for other parts. So that, you know, like a user experience, user, in user interaction design is one of the key parts that we have been exploring as well. Uh, for a lot of like, you know, um, in some of our customer interactions, like, you know, we also provide some of like help in designing these like, you know, uh, workflows to, 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 to leverage these large language models as well. Um, so that's one aspect. And the second aspect is like, I, I feel there's a general trend because you mentioned UI, right? Because like conventional UI is more of like, you know, you click, you get something, uh, you, you, you drag, you pull something, right? You enter something. Uh, I feel like those things will will st still stay for uh, you know some important parts like for visualization you you always need that right mm -hmm. uh, but you know like uh, you know I I want to have a projection for the upcoming one or two years we'll see like a mall and mall of the software UIs in, including on including the security software UI, UIs it will shift to like you know having a conversational component right like that's a that's about like you know a partial replacement of things or upgrading of things. That that that's what I believe will be a very strong. But it's still uh, you you converse, but then you you can still visualize. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You yeah. converse, you still visualize, uh, and you know a lot of the a lot of things that you know we will put put efforts in is integrating with those things, right? Because uh, you know, like sometimes you, you trigger those stuff, you need to ensure like you uh, you integrate well with those tools, uh, you know, triggering the right things, and you know, like uh, making sure like. Uh, uh, you got the, the 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 right outcome from the software that you are orchestrating, right? So those like uh, uh you know integration is also a very important piece. Uh and and you know yeah, just putting it together, I feel like you know, this UI UX stuff first is that uh is is going to have an upgrading of these conversational parts of the things. Uh, and the second is like you know uh, for these function calling models, uh it need uh you know very uh, new way of design like the user interaction user engagement flows. Uh, and third is like you know, uh, very importantly, uh, integrating with some of like the major software, soft, uh, major tools uh, for uh, uh, making like people's life easier. That's another important part regarding this topic. So you folks are a startup, so naturally you have to focus. So mm -hmm. as we mentioned, your focus is cybersecurity, mm -hmm. and to a large extent, your focus on this function calling co-pilots. Mm -hmm. But uh, John, does that mean that? Uh, other approaches like uh, I don't know retrieval, augmented generation, knowledge graphs, mm -hmm. um, fine tuning, mm -hmm. uh, custom LLMs are they off the table for you? Or over time, you you imagine you folks will in, will absorb the capabilities yeah. you need to address the cybersecurity market, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's more of the, uh, the latter, yeah. right? So basically, like you know, we naturally need to focus. Uh, and I think this is a, a one of the area like function calling is a very important stuff. A lot of cybersecurity customer asking us about. Uh, but of course, like uh, there's a lot of other service areas uh, that they need help on. So you can imagine our mission in Nexus Flow is really to uh, deliver the uh, you know generative AI solutions for cybersecurity professionals for cybersecurity verticals. Uh, to make their life easier, to make them more successful, right? Uh, and you know, like uh, uh, you know, we are willing to continue to invite what makes them successful, right? Uh, and you know, like this is about like uh, we build the uh, base, like you know, uh, model capabilities. We build like you know the the toolings for our, our customers. We build the integration for our customers. You know, gradually, like step by step, we'll, we'll keep like uh, moving ourselves towards making our customers' life more successful. And in closing, I'm assuming you're hiring. And if, uh, of so, course, of course. <laughs> if so, uh, if so, what are you looking? What are you hiring? 
Yeah, so uh, I think we are hiring like in in quite a few like uh, uh, areas. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to spend like sure. you know five minutes talking yeah. about the JDs, but you know, like uh, of course, like our engineering teams we are looking for like you know applied ML engineers, right? Like we are looking for like you know uh, in like uh, uh, ML system engineers as well, because you know these large language models naturally needs like a uh, system components, uh, and also like we well like we have a lot of like you know uh, uh, you know software engineers from cybersecurity background and from general software engineering background as well. So you can imagine that's more or less our like uh, engineering team, right? But, you know, we also like uh, uh, hiring like, uh, uh, you know, uh, product professionals as well, right? Like uh, we, we are early on that because right now- like What, what about, uh, because because you have an open source com component, do you need developer relations or evangelists as well? That's a, that's a very good point. You know, like uh, uh, me and our CEO, we have been part time being this evangelist for a while. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we'll see like how this like community grows because like uh, very interesting. I, I think in our Discord, we already have like you know, um, 200 ish 200 like uh, developers in there. Like uh, they routinely like asking questions and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, like we have a lot of like uh, evangelist like workloads that we need to do. Like you know, we need to uh, talk outside. Uh, right, so uh, I think naturally we we'll, we'll, at a certain time point we we'll have the need for the evangelist as well. Um, you know, uh, you know, right now you can imagine like our like uh, founders team is like you know covering a lot of these like aspects. And with that, thank you, John. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Ben.